Hola, Anna. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, my pronunciation is no good either, um, but I will give it a go. Um, very warm welcome, everyone. I'm really excited to be bringing this uh, live event to you this evening. Rioja, Spain's most eminent wine region, a treasure trove of diversity today, offering wine lovers an amazing choice of delicious wines. And for me, the key word is diversity, because Rioja now uh, produces quite a range of styles of wine from modern to traditional. Um, and I'm sure this will be part of the discussion that we have uh, tonight with the three outstanding producers that we've got, all three of them representing the fine wine end of Rioja. El Sacramento, Viña Real and Lopez de Haro. And I'm delighted that joining us to share stories and answer questions that you might have are the producers themselves, the guys that actually get their hands dirty, making the wines, working in the vineyards. And of course, in the virtual format, they are being beamed into your homes directly from Spain, uh, from Rioja. We have Etienne Cordonnier from El Sacramento, Maria Laria of Venue Real, and Ricardo Arambare of Lopez de Haro. Um, welcome to the three of you. Um, I think the last time that I saw your faces was actually on my last trip and my only trip, uh, buying trip this year, which was in February, uh, just before uh, our first lockdown here uh, in the UK. But a very, very warm welcome to all three of you. We're going to uh, start um, by um, starting with you, Etienne, um, and on El Sacramento, which is a relatively new name, a, new, a newer label, a newer producer, but in quite um, an ancient part of Rioja itself. So welcome Etienne and I'll hand over to you for um, you to give us a nice presentation on um, El Sacramento. Yes, for, thank you Pierre. It's a, a real pleasure to, to share with you and with the, the members of the Wine Society the, this meeting. So just to present <coughs> El Sacramento, um, I don't know if we can show the, the map of the, of the region to situate a little bit uh, uh, where we are. And uh, there is two important things to understand uh, Rioja in general. And we are, uh, we can see it very, very clearly in this map. We are between a Sierra up north. Uh, with uh, well, 1,400 uh, meters high to the Ebro, it's uh, 400 meters high. So we have uh, a special climate condition because we have the influence of Atlantic uh, weather condition with the, all the, uh, the Bay of Biscay uh, uh, bad weather. And then we have the Ebro Valley who, who, who keep to us the Mediterranean condition. In, we are in a, in a climatic border. And you know the Grand Vin or fine wines used to be elaborated in, in boundary conditions. Like Bordeaux is southern climate but Atlantic influence. And those, this complexity give the complexity into the wines. And the second thing is the complexity in geology. Uh, this area of Rioja was a border of a sea. And <coughs> when the sea retires, it left here uh, limestone and calcareous soils, which are very good for the vine because it kept the uh, constant hydrometry to the roots of the vines. So the nutritional could be constant during all year. And the climatic and geologic condition as those two, fac two, two, two factors, very important to the characteristics of Rioja and able to make wine, uh, able to age a lot. 
You can see is the view of area of the winery where we are in the village. Over there is La Guardia, very old villages. The vine here is a huge tradition in uh, centuries and century of culture, agriculture. And it's uh, uh, a lot of different plots. It's not uh, constant. Each plot has its own characters and uh, with its quality and effects. And uh, there is some plots very, very balanced and other one were more difficult, but it, the, the local condition are very important. And that is another advantage for elaborated Grand Vin is to have this complexity. And so the winery where we are, we, we, we well, it's, it's small, quite small. It's 20 hectares around the winery, but 20 hectares, but that doesn't mean that is uh, everything uh, equal. It's, we have 20 uh, tanks to elaborate from each plot uh, to keep this diversity. In this image, you can see, you know, I am there with Jesus Velia. You know, it's in the, uh, after the pruning, no? when the vegetation come out. And the work in the vineyard, uh, you know, if you are owner of the vineyard, you can accept to produce low yields. And we are doing about uh, 3,000 kilo per hectare. And it's quite a few because the denomination authorizes us much more. But to go to quality, uh, I think uh, the, the, the yield is very, is very important. If you see the, the big vintages of Rioja of the, year, the, the 60s, the 70s, the pr production yield was around uh, uh, 4,000 kilos. And so the, uh, the production and the way we are managing the, the plots, uh, we have to adapt to each one. It's like a person, you know, each one is character and you have to manage the, the agriculture. Uh, it's much more easier to go on conventional agriculture and to produce the maximum yields, but it's much more complicated to go on low yields and good quality e e ecologic uh, production. Well, you have here an image of a harvester with a London t-shirt, that's a special uh, hi to, to England. <laughs> we, we harvest in, uh, in crates. So we enter in the winery the, the, the grapes in physical, good physical condition. And the last selection we are doing when we enter the grapes in the winery. The objective is to enter in the, in the winery uh, uh, grapes and, uh, in a homogeneous maturity. And all the work in the vineyards is to, to go to this point at the moment that they harvest to have the optimum maturity and good sanitary condition. And so we can have in the, the, the best of each plot. Well, it's a very chateau style uh, to this way of, of working. This is the one we, uh, the day we inaugurated because it's only two years ago. Our first harvest here is 2018. Before we, uh, I was renting facilities in other winery. And then the inauguration, we made it with the president of the Basque country. And well, it, just, it was a special moment. And we have only concrete tanks. Uh, it's a very traditional. Uh, Bordeaux style way of working, but for red wine, the concrete is a very, very good material because the control of temperature is much more easier. And then, uh, and also the, the wine clean easily uh, in the concrete than in stainless tanks. And um, well, no, it's, it's small, but uh, small is beautiful. <laughs> and now, but we have the ability to separate uh, each plot and all the work we are uh, making before the harvest is separating everything. Like uh, a cooker he is taking care of good ingredients. And after elaboration, the way of working is to assemble the assemblage. 
And then we know we can test every tank and then we decide which assemblage we will do for the Grova. As I said, it's Bordeaux style because we, the objective is to produce one wine, the best possible, and then we have a second wine because we, may, we are making selection. And Mona is, for the people who know Bordeaux, it's very classical, but Mona, it is my option for way of working. And uh, well, this winery is, uh, is fantastic for the day-to-day -day working. And after the, the harvest, we rack all the wine in barrels for a year, a year and a half. It depends on the vintages before bottling. Here you can see the architecture of the, of the building. Well, we are in a special place with a point of view fantastic. And uh, well, no, I, in my previous job, I was selling wine from other countries in Belgium. And uh, one uh, point in common for the Grand Vin is that they, all, they always are placed in very good situation. And uh, we are on a promontory and with ventilated uh, condition, better for the, for the maturation for the grapes. And this is the place in this uh, Porsche, no? this is the place when we are doing the, the last selection, we enter the, the, the grapes there to go in the, in the tanks room. So, uh, sorry, Pierre. So, so the, 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 this is the well, this is the presentation in general, uh, quickly of, of our condition and where the our way of working is to to go on the details. Uh, there is no one uh, details who dominate the other one. It's uh, from the the, the 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 vine, the roots where the, the vine is got this alimentation to the final blend. It's a lot of details and we, we have to work on this way to, to represent the best quality of the terroir we have. Etienne, could you explain the, the, the name El Sacramento? Why El Sacramento? <laughs> yes, El Sacramento is the place, the name of the main plot here in the uh, cadastre, no? the, the name of the place, because La Guardia is a middle aged village and uh, in the Middle Ages, in all, all over Europe, there was some brotherhood taking care of poor and sick people. And uh, it, well, it was a social security of this time. And uh, one of the brotherhood in La Guardia was owner of this place in the 16th century. And from then, from there, it, the, the name of the brother was Santissimo Sacramento. And then the place is called El Sacramento because of the name of the brotherhood. And they, they, they were cultivating vine in the 16th century and the incomes were for, dedicated for the activity of the brotherhood. And it's very interesting to see at this time where it was not, not all planted, no, it was multicultural, but this place was already with, with vines. And well, no, it's a beautiful history. And when I bought the, the vines, well, no, they were already planted. Uh, the average is uh, 40, 45 years old. And, but the culture is historically. And so I have to, to, I was looking for a name. And so I choose very easily El Sacramento because of this history. And it's a beautiful spot. I thought that photo um, that was taken, an aerial photo of the, of the the small property and the small winery um, is stunning. Um, really expressive of um, uh, this part of Rioja. So thank you very much, Etienne, to talk us through. We'll come back to you when we taste uh, the 2014 vintage uh, together, which I'm much looking forward to. Um, we're now going to uh, move over to Vigne Real. Uh, which is um, one of the, I think, a name that probably needs little introduction um, to members of the Wine Society. Vigne Real is, is one of the greatest fine wine brands of the Cunei, um, of the Cunei umbrella 
company that makes excellent wines right across um, their portfolio. And we're joined by Maria, who um, looks after the winemaking, um, um, particularly with Vignorial, but also with Imperial, I think, in, in Cune. So Maria, welcome. Tell us, tell us about Vignorial. Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Pierre, and thank you, all of you, for your interest and for finding time to, to come to, to this wine and tasting. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to, to be here with you. And uh, so I'm, I am the winemaker of Cune, as Pierre tell you. Um, I am Riojana, born and bred, and I have studied enology in, in France. And I have traveled, but years ago I decided to, to settle in my home region because uh, I have known this, this land and this soils since I was a child. And I knew the, the great potential that uh, we have uh, here to, to produce the, the great wines. No? So uh, I joined uh, uh, Kune more than 25 years ago. And for 10 years now, I have uh, been the chief uh, winemaker. And when I began here at Cune, I worked uh, alongside uh, Basilio, and I had the opportunity to, to learn uh, how all the wines uh, at Cune and, and Viña Real when, were made, and learn the, the legacy and uh, so on. And so uh, just uh, an introduction to, to Cune, because Cune is the acronym for Compañía Vinícola del Norte de España. And Cune is one of the oldest wineries in Rioja because it was founded in the 1879 by two, by two brothers. And to this day is uh, controlled and managed by the same family, currently is in the, in the fifth uh, generation. And in this uh, 141 years history, they have only been uh, five winemakers, the same as the, as the number of generations. And well, the, our focus has always been on the quality and of the of the market, because high quality has always been the, the philosophy of the Urrutia family. No? And well, about Cune, Cune Crest is the Spanish flag, and we have been uh, flying this this flag and have been ambassador for for Spain since the since the 1879. And uh, so in, in Rioja, Cune owns uh, four wineries. In Aro, that is the capital of uh, Rioja Alta, uh, we produce uh, Cune and Imperial. Imperial is uh, our premium brand, and we only produce Imperial when we consider the, the vintage is excellent, and only reserva and Gran Reserva are made under this uh, Imperial label. And recently, we have released uh, also a new wine that uh, is called Asua Crianza. That is the Asua is the family name of, of the founders of Cune, and uh, this wine is made uh, with the grapes uh, from Naro, just like uh, our wines uh, used to be many decades ago. And uh, I speak about this wine because this wine is only in the in the best uh, restaurants of uh, Spain and also for the clients of the, the wine uh, society. And uh, it comes from vines that are planted on hillsides or slopes or mainly clay with uh, limestone. And uh, it's from uh, Rioja Alta, from Aro, that is uh, influenced by the Atlantic. And, and in Aro, the conditions are uh, cool and sunny and, and very dry. And because the summer days and, and cool nights, uh, then the grapes in, in this area arrive uh, very, very slowly, um, building a complexity and uh, preserving the, the good freshness from balance uh, acidity uh, levels. And uh, um, oh, that is about uh, Rioja Alta and the two wineries, Imperial and Cune. And uh, 20 minutes down the road, we arrive to Rio Jalavesa. And uh, here in Rio Jalavesa, we have uh, uh, two other wineries. We have uh, Viñedos de Continuo and we have Viña Real. Now you see in the picture the, 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 the barrel 
a seller from for uh, Viña Real uh, uh, reservas and grand reservas. Well, Vineyards de Contino is a single vineyard, a single estate founded in the 1973. It's a charming property where we make uh, the top uh, premium wines, such as uh, Contino Reserva. And uh, close uh, to Contino, also in the Jalavesa, we have Viña Real. That, uh, this winery is, is the focus of uh, today uh, tasting, and we are going to, to taste uh, uh, later, Viña Real, Gran Reserva, 2010. Then, uh, let me introduce the, 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 the brand. Here we have the, the bottles in our cellar, because Gran Reserva is in, in the cellar uh, after bottling for at least uh, three, three years. And, uh, well, Viña Real uh, dates back uh, to 1920s. And today it has become uh, well known as a pioneering winery because of its uh, winemaking techniques. But uh, Viña Real is uh, also a, a timeless brand that uh, has always stayed true to, to its origins by being uh, genuine and, and sincere. And uh, Viña Real is, is one of the iconic uh, brand in Rioja. It aged uh, beautifully. And we have in our cellar vintage, such uh, 1938 or 1959, which uh, are still testing uh, super. And uh, oh, we, we have a careful balance between uh, tradition and modernity. And that uh, has defined it, the, the form and the, and the content of, of Viña Real, even since uh, it was uh, created. We have a, a map here that you can see where, where the, the grapes uh, are, are from. Uh, well, um, an example of uh, our innovation is that we making wine using, using gravity flow. And uh, well, today many modern wineries have adopted this uh, modern technique, but in fact, it was Kune uh, who pioneered in, uh, the gravity flow in the 1989 and after Viña Real in 2004. No? Well, about the, the grapes of uh, Viña Real, uh, this, have, uh, this have always uh, come from El Ciego in Rio Jalavesa, always. It's a small village where I was born and uh, with uh, a great uh, vines and, and wine uh, tradition. And uh, it's, it's, um, these vineyards border a, a road which uh, was named a uh, Royal Road. In Spain, we said Camino Real. And this is where it, its name, Viña Real, comes from. And uh, well, we have the, the, the small uh, map here because in the, in the last years, Cune has, uh, has uh, invested uh, uh, some of the, in, in some of the best plots, plots in La Guardia and La, in La Bastida, La Guardia and La Bastida, that you can say in you can see in this map. And uh, these are uh, all vineyards with uh, small productions that warranty the, the continued uh, supply of the finest grapes uh, for, the, for the production of, uh, of our wines in, in Villa Real. Because, uh, well, uh, Rioja La Esa is in fact uh, a, a part of uh, the Basque Country. It's in the north bank of the Ebro River. And this is the smallest uh, sub uh, region in Rioja, because as you know, uh, in Rioja is uh, Rioja Alta, Rioja Oriental, and Rioja Alavesa. That is the smallest one with about uh, uh, 13,000 of hectares. And uh, generally, as uh, Etienne uh, says, uh, the vines grow at an altitude between uh, 450 to 750 meters. Uh, to the north, to the north, we have um, a very strong Atlantic uh, influence that brings uh, good uh, rainfall and milder temperature because of the protection of the Sierra de Cantabria mountains. And then the, the warm air comes from the from the east of Spain, from the, Medi the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea. And, uh, and, and it gives uh, plenty of uh, sunshine. And 
is, I think, uh, this mix uh, between the, the climatic uh, influences, Atlantic, uh, continental, and, and Mediterranean, that uh, defines the, the, the Rioja terroir. No? And of course, the, the soils that, that play an important part. And in Rioja la Vesta, uh, we have mainly limestone and, and clay. But I think the, 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 fit, the feature of uh, Rioja la Vesta is the, is the landscape because it's very, very nice. We have uh, the slopes with, uh, with terraces and small plots and the old traditional uh, bush vines. And uh, well, uh, Viña Real is made with uh, about 90% uh, uh, Tempranillo and 5% Graciano. And Tempranillo, of course, is the king uh, red variety in Rioja and is widely planted uh, in Rioja Alta and Rioja La Vesa. And it is uh, said to be indigenous of, uh, of the, the region. But in Viña Real and Reserva, in the blend, we have a small proportion of Graciano that uh, is a, a variety that complements uh, very well Tempranillo because it gives uh, great uh, color and, and acidity. And uh, well, the Tempranillo and Graciano perform especially well in, in Rioja Alta and Rioja La Vesa because uh, I, 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 I uh, say you, uh, during the ripening of the grapes, days are hot and nights are good. And again, this combination of, of different climates uh, is perfect for this, uh, for this variety. And uh, well, in a few minutes, uh, we are going to taste uh, the Piña Real and Reserva 2010. Well, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maria. That was uh, fascinating. And again, some, some brilliant slides with some uh, brilliant photos. We've had, um, there's been a great bit of chat on the uh, Zoom coming up, uh, which it looks like there's um, probably been quite an increase going on of the consumption of Rioja at the moment here in the UK based on, on the chat. And just really a reminder uh, for anyone that's tuning in live as a participant that if you've got any questions, do send those, uh, submit those to the tastings team. And, and at the end of the uh, tasting, at the, uh, towards the end, we'll, we'll try and uh, get in as many of those questions as we possibly can. Uh, anything that you want to ask the panelists about their particular wines, bodegas, or just generally about uh, Rioja in, in general. Um, but without further ado, going to our third and um, final, but not least, um, um, from Lopez de Haro, Ricardo, um, with the wonderful backdrop of all the photos um, that you take in the, in the vineyards. Uh, Ricardo, welcome. Um, you're going to tell us a bit about Lopez uh, de Haro. I've seen actually that, that, that there is some, someone drinking Dominum QP at the moment, which is also one of your uh, wines um, uh, from Lopez de Haro, but with a slightly different uh, brand. But welcome, uh, Ricardo, and over to you to tell us a little bit more. Hi there. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my presentation with you, guys. Uh, that works. That works, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, well, so first, thank you very much. I'm super excited because, uh, well, I'm a big fan of uh, Wine Society. I always tell to Pierre that please open a Wine Society in Spain at some point because we <laughs> need one here <laughs> with such an amazing wines. And uh, well, so I'm very glad to be chatting with you. I saw that someone is drinking QP, which uh, actually is one of our wines uh, that Pierre uh, selected in one of their visits. And I'm gonna explain you a little bit about Hacienda Lopedero and us. So, well, I wanted to start with one of these uh, crazy photos that explain a little bit about history of us. So we, we are, I'm like Maria, I'm born and raised in Rioja and uh, I'm a Riojano. And uh, well, my family is coming from a very small village called Badaran in, uh, later I will show you where exactly it is in Alto Najerilla. And well, my family has been always, uh, like many other families in this area, uh, related to wine, to the vineyard, and to make a small quantities of wine. It was my father, the one who gave the first big step in, uh, in investment and in production. And then it was um, later, it was my brother and I, which uh, here you can see 
my brother on the right and myself on the left, and the middle is Raul, who is our chief winemaker, who in a, about 12 years ago, we took over. And I like this picture because I think it explains a little bit the crazy way of doing uh, that we have and a little bit mixture between our history and, the, and what Rioja is and uh, what uh, we we've started to try to do. And talking a bit, uh, <clears throat> sorry, a little bit about the, the philosophy of how we, how we make wine, we always say that uh, as a winery, we think that we are one part of the history. So we can never forget about the past, and, but we always have to uh, look to the forward. forward. And uh, I like always to show this picture and, or this one, for example, that shows a little bit the personality of who we are in La Rioja. So La Rioja has been always a land of uh, trespassing, so coming around, commerce, a uh, very, very rich land. And I think that part of our philosophy is sharing, is enjoying life, it's uh, having visits and try to treat everybody well, like when Pierre comes to visit us. And I think the style of our wines are also uh, in line with this, with, this, um, with this philosophy. I think that every region in Ribera del Duero, in Toro, in Galicia, always have a, a lot to do with the history and a lot to do to the weather. And, and I think that Rioja, this hospitality, it's, it's exactly the style of wine that, uh, that we have. And when we talk about this style of wine, uh, it's when we talk about this fine wine style, this vinos finos. So I think that Maria and Etienne has explained fantastic before the type of weather that we have here. And I was sorry that I think this, this is coming out. Oops, yeah. And uh, well, so, uh, so in, in Rioja, we have all this uh, medium uh, weather that, um, so this, uh, co uh, it, uh, it's medium uh, continental that uh, gives this uh, style of uh, a little bit more elegant style than other areas in Rioja. And I think this is the philosophy and this is the work that we've always tried to do to, uh, to express the Lope de Aro wine. So just to, for you to, uh, to know where we are positioned, so Lope de Aro, it's in Son Sierra. So uh, as you can see, there is Rioja La Besa, Rioja Alta, but there is the river, who is the river, the uh, Ebro River, who is crossing. And uh, Lope de Aro, it's in the left side, in the left bank, as Maria was talking before, like uh, actually the two uh, winers that we're talking uh, today also. Okay, so this is a photo of uh, our winery from the, from the, from the, the air. So you have the river on the left, then the castle of San Vicente La Sonsierra, which is the village where our winery is positioned. And in the back is this Sierra La Cantabria, these mountains about 1,200 meters high, which are, well, are a little bit uh, protecting us from the north winds and create this medium uh, or medium continent, uh, continental medium uh, weather. Okay. Then this is a photo from the um, from the river. Actually, this is a photo, a photo from uh, actually right now, which uh, which is uh, the autumn time that I recommend you, which is a wonderful time. And for you to understand the where the areas where our vineyards are coming from. So I was mentioning that as a philosophy of winery, we try to uh, show the this style of fine wines that made Rioja. Uh, like about 150 years ago to become popular internationally. So uh, for, for that purpose, uh, we are looking for colder areas in Rioja. So if you go to the more uh, oriental, to the eastern part of Rioja, then you are having a little bit more Mediterranean style of, uh, of climate and a little bit more warmer style of wines, which are wonderful. But what we are looking for, our philosophy, is to look for these more, let's say, colder climates in Rioja. So where you see this Rioja La Besa, this Son Sierra, and this Alto Najerilla, these areas are the three areas in the western part of Rioja who are closer to the mountains and have a little bit more colder climate and better conditions for this, uh, let's say, uh, medium body and fine style of uh, elegant wines, okay? Then I want to show you, this is a photo of, uh, of the winery but you can see the white uh, soil of this calcareous clay, this uh, uh, more uh, northern part of Rioja. So if we go back, we have Rioja La Besa and Son Sierra with the type of soil dominating is this particular white soil. And this, you can see uh, an old vineyard uh, with this uh, typical calcareous clay. And then if we go to the other area where we source our grapes, this is the Alto Najerilla. And this, you can see that the, the soil changed completely. So this is a more 
a ferrous clay uh, start, uh, style of soil a uh, with a little bit more acidity. And uh, this, but this is an area, this is actually the region where my family is coming from. And this is a region of really, really, really old vineyards, okay, which are mainly dominated by Grenache, Garnacha. So the other area is more Tempranillo from us. Uh, this is more for the Garnacha vineyards. And what is something which is marvelous is, uh, well, these really, really old vineyards that here, this one actually needs some help to, to maintain still, okay, because this is uh, actually, this is a vineyard that is uh, more than a hundred years old, okay? And so the combination of these two areas is what is, uh, what, what is creating the style that uh, we have as uh, Hacienda Lopedea. So this is uh, another photo that you can see a little bit the views of the river, uh, the views of the of, uh, of this. this. This in particular is the area of the Son Sierra. Okay, so going going ahead. Sorry that it's now opening everything. Yeah, so going ahead. Uh, opa. So today uh, we are going to talk about a new release for the Wine Society that I'm very very happy. Later we'll talk a little bit about the wine. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the philosophy of the of the project. So Classica, it's a, it's a wine, it's a collection that we released to create the top of our house. So uh, this philosophy that I was talking about, the fine wines that we, we want to make, uh, this uh, collection is trying to exactly remember the style of wine that made Rioja become popular about 150 years ago. So Rioja, uh, our grand, 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 grandfathers, they were doing one at home, they were doing it in a very familiar way, and uh, they were doing a, a, let's say, quality but simple style of wine. So then the first people who traveled to Bordeaux, they learned this way of doing wine, and then is when this style of fine wine of Vinos Finos st uh, started to do. So in this collection, what we have to try to do is to pay homage to this style of wine, try to recover this style of wine that become uh, Rioja Popular 150 years ago, and at the same time to pay homage to these people. So later I will explain in particular who is the guy who is uh, in the label of the Classica 2001. But this is a collection that every single vintage, that it's only in excellent vintages, will be uh, showing one very important person that has made Rioja to become what it is today. So, well, this is a little bit summary of uh, what uh, Lope de Aro, what Son Sierra, Alto Najerilla uh, is and uh, our philosophy and Clásica and about us. So, well, I will be very happy to answer any of your questions later and taste with Pierre the Clásica 2001. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Brilliant uh, slides and uh, as always, lots of energy um, and excitement from you. Um, um, thank you, thank you very much. So we've got, um, I, I suppose I've got, I'm the lucky one here. We were talking about this just before we, we started the session that um, I think I'm the only one that's probably privileged to have a bottle of each of your wines um, to taste. Um, so let's kick off with El Sacramento 2014, Etienne. Um, and um, tell us a little bit about the 2014. I'm going to pour myself a little bit as you check through. Cheers. Salud. You're muted, Etienne. We just need to unmute. You need to... You, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Just before the tasting properly, right? Uh, I have a, an image of a, a scientist in, in physician who was noble in physician in the 19th century. And he was saying that uh, our poor spirits of human beings uh, want to divide, to separate, uh, to analyze between flavor, between physics, biology, chemistry, geology in the wine. But nature doesn't know about that. Uh, for nature, it's everything together. And the important thing is the balance. And uh, uh, as the wine comes, the vine comes from the mineral roots, where is the roots from the vine, and goes to the, to the, to the fruits. And in between the, the wooden part and the vegetal part, then we can find in the wine all these flavors and uh, 
What's important is when I taste wine, I like to compare uh, the balance between the body and the elegance, uh, the persistence and, and the expression. And I, I, I used to, to, to use the, the, the wet treats of the wine is a good comparison between the silk uh, or mop at the extreme and the organization of the tannins, the, the density, uh, the parallel of the tannins is, is, the, is the important thing in the wine. And, and before tasting the, the, the really the which fruit flavor, which uh, uh, woods or, or, or I think the, 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 the balance in general is, is much more important. But in this case, in this wine, well, no, you, if you take care of fruit, it's raspberry, red berries. And if you, you're thinking of the, the, the vegetal world is peppers, but you can find also the, 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 and the roots, flavors, and, and at the end you find also the, the minerals, salty, and the freshness of the mineral world. But it's a complexity of all those things that's made the balance and the happiness to drink it. And to, to be able to, to do a grand vin, you have to combine all this, I think. And this is a wine of uh, already one or six, uh, maybe tomorrow, seven years old, and it's still young still fresh, the, the fruit is alive. What is the, um, Etienne, what is the grape blend of the 2014? So here we have, um, well, no, traditionally, like, say, like Maria said, we have the Tempranillo and, and Graciano. Well, Tempranillo is, the, the first quality of Tempranillo is the elegance. And uh, to have the right balance, uh, between elegance and body, you have to cultivate Tempranillo in low yield. And then the Graciano, it's uh, only three or, I don't remember exactly, three or four percent of Graciano, but the Graciano gives uh, vitality to the wine, more acidity, more... Uh, well, no, you know, to, to elaborate a grand vin, uh, you have, uh, you can, uh, with uh, one, Tenth of percent of one barrel from a press from from a tank, you can change the profile. So uh, three percent of Graciano, uh, for some people, it can be very low. But uh, in the right balance, you have to choose the, the right level of Graciano. Uh, we say here Graciano traditionally is Gracias no. Uh, 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 please, no, or, or, or gracia, no, because alone the gracia is complicated. It could be very good, but in, a, in an assemblage, the gracia is very helpful, very helpful. And uh, <coughs> so we, all the grand vin, I think, in Rioja, they have a little bit of gracia, no. That's very helpful. But the, the first thing is the elegance of the temprani, you dominate this wine. It's a very deep color and very full-bodied and velvety and really intense wine that um, has quite a, you know, a lovely sort of concentrated finish. It feels like it's got a long, long life ahead of it as well. I mean, it's, it's for people that are not familiar with your wines, I would say the 2014 is a is a great one to start with El Sacramento because it's got a lovely ripeness that although it has a, a long life ahead, that ripeness and concentration makes it really quite appealing, even in its youth, uh, to drink today. Yes, and, and 14 vintage was very classical for Rioja. Uh, it is the, the right balance between those influences, Atlantic and Mediterranean. Uh, if it's too Mediterranean, the weather condition, then the wine is, is much more opulent. And uh, if it's very Atlantic, it's too much freshness. And this vintage 14 was very classic, very good vintage classical because it's a good, right balance in weather condition between those two influences. And here we have a, a very drinkable wine, very quite opulent, but very velvet. 
a lot of softness. Etienne, what kind of it, the oak? Is it all French oak? Yes, 100%. We use 100% French oak. The, the French oak is much more elegant than the American oak. And we used to renovate one third every year. So our barrels, the, the oldest is three years old. And every year, every year we, we buy one third new, new barrels. Man, I, till now it's a good balance we found and, and we, we, we're keeping in, in this way. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a, a, a joy to, to, to try with you. Um, so, we'll move now on to uh, the Vigne Real Grand Reserva 2010, Maria. Um, a wine I tried for several years. I think you probably released, when did you release the 2010 Grand Reserva? 2010 uh, in 2016. Yes, right, yeah. So this is a wine that IIT will have shipped a few years ago and we've kept until now to offer yes. to our members, ten, 10 years on. Yes, yes, we released the 2017, yes. Yes, because it's our reserva, then we keep uh, at least uh, two years in barrel and after three, three years in, in bottle, yeah. then... Uh, Okay. Well, I think uh, what is interesting in this wine is, is the, the complexity that uh, comes from the, the old vines and combined with the profile of, of the vintage. No? Because we are in the 2010, that was an excellent uh, vintage in Rioja. Sometimes uh, people always ask uh, because uh, 2010 and 2011 both were excellent. And everybody asks, but what, what is better? And I don't know what is, what is better. But uh, 2010 is, is uh, really excellent vintage, very, very fine, very elegant. And it's a wine that is delicate uh, and fresh with still aromas of, of red and, and black fruit coming from the Tempranillo grape. I think it's uh, the typical Tempranillo expression in Viña Real wines. Uh, are fresh, fruity, and black and red, very fruit, uh, aromatics, and, and, and liquorice is uh, all, it, are also very, very common in these wines. And uh, well, I think uh, we, we have a great balance on the palate, and uh, smooth tannins. Mm. It's, it's very gentle. Narrow this too, yes, yes. I think this is the, the classic Viña Real Gran Reserva with an elegant nose and gentle tannins, good backbone, notes of uh, minerality, spices and, and coffee and some chocolate because the, the age in barrel. The texture is, is very soft and, and velvety. And Maria, what kind of barrels do you use for the Viña Real Gran Reserva? For Viña Real, we have... Uh, new and, and one fill uh, their barrels and they are American and traditionally in Rioja we have had a lot of American uh, barrel but uh, there are uh, well, some, some years ago that we have also French uh, barrels. More or less in this wine we have 60% uh, American 40% uh, French uh, oak. Yes. Which, is, which actually is what makes it quite distinct and different to El Sacramento being entirely French oak. Yes. We are Grand Reserva with the American oak component, which is, which is more traditional. It's in more traditional, yeah. yes, right. Yes, it's a wine that is, uh, this was released in the 1920s, the first time. Uh, and we have, we have changed, of course, a lot of things. Um, but uh, we keep uh, these uh, this things, no? the, the tradition, the... The, but, the, uh, the American oak component, and I think combined with the, the Tempranillo that you have, gives for me, always reminds me of, I, I think it's like a creamy vanilla carrot, yes, which is yes. really well balanced and enhanced. Yes, the wine. Right. yes we speak about, about Tempranillo, this... Uh, this uh, 
the, the delicate the, the finesse and also with the, the barrels it's a very very integrated technique I think and uh, it's not very present but it's true that uh, that gives some uh, elegance and Maria can you can you tell me the um, so I don't know if everyone can see this shape of bottle which is yes the shape of bottle is there a reason yes. it's burgundy burgundy bottle because uh, when 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 Cune was funded, always uh, we have uh, had uh, Imperial and Viña Real, and uh, well, Cune was funded because the Philoxera uh, uh, finished with the vineyards in in France, and then French people is coming in, in Rioja, and then uh, we had uh, the two wines, Imperial, and people said uh, Imperial is more like a Bordeaux wines. And we had Viña Real, and people say Viña Real is more like uh, Burgundy wines. But that is, was a lot of years ago. Now it's, it's not that. But, but for, from the beginning, uh, uh, we used the Bordeaux bottle for Imperial and the Burgundy bottle for uh, Viña Real. And we, we have kept this, these bottles, yes. And Excellent. that is why we have a Burgundy bottle in Viña Real because it's a, like a Burgundy uh, wine, you know. Brilliant, thank you very much, Maria. Um, Ricardo, you. the 2001 Classico Grand Reserva, with the, with the, you need to tell us about the, the, this interesting man on the front label. Fantastic, well, I, uh, Pierre, uh, with an I discussed that I think as we are giving for, this is a 2001 bottle, so it's uh, 20, almost 20 years old. So we have this special opener that I, for if in, a, in any case someone buys, I'm gonna show how this works, okay? And, uh, while I explain a little bit about, um, about uh, this uh, person in the label. So, well, this person in the label is called uh, Manuel Quintano, which uh, Manuel Quintano was the first entrepreneur, actually he was a clerical person, so he was a priest, that he traveled to Bordeaux and well, uh, while he was in Bordeaux, he learned this new way of, uh, of doing wine that they had in Bordeaux. Remember that Bordeaux has been trading with the uh, UK for since the 11th century, but uh, our tradition exporting wines, uh, fine wines is, is shorter than that. So when he traveled to uh, Bordeaux, he learned the way of doing wines in Bordeaux. And then he was the first entrepreneur to make uh, this style of wines in Rioja at the end of the 18th century. So. Uh, this is Manuel Quintano. So this, this is why it's so important that we wanted to highlight the personality and uh, show it on the label. So I just opened the, the cork. So this is how it ends up. And uh, I, re I strongly recommend to open it with this opener because uh, as is uh, some years old, uh, sometimes can be broken with a regular uh, bottle opener. And well, talking about the wines, every time that you open a bottle, Pierre, uh, of wine, uh, you are talking about the history of the time, okay? On that time, it was my father in church, okay? My father, even he was born from this Alto Najerilla, this Rioja Alta in the south that I was mentioning. He was not a big fan of red grapes from the area. So we were not using the, our old vineyards for uh, making red wines. We were using them for making roses. Uh, so this wine, it's only made from the Son Sierra area. So mainly... San Vicente and all these vineyards that are uh, in the southern part of uh, this uh, Sierra Cantabria, this Toloño uh, mountain in San Vicente. So, well, uh, I think that a wine like this that is 19 years old, uh, this collection, we only release great vintages. So 2001, one of the best great vintages, uh, Maria was mentioning before, 2010, 2011, 2001 was one of the best of the at least 50 years uh, ago, one probably the best or one of the best. And, uh, and actually, I think that the wine reflects very well what the vintage was. It was, uh, you know, uh, you know, perfectly, actually, I was not even started the university, to be honest. So <laughs> I remember <laughs> I was just, I was just uh, 18 years old <laughs> at that time. Okay. But, uh, you know, I remember that, you know, the, this, this year was fantastic. I, I remember my family talking about that and, and, you know, the, the, you know, the La Viveza, so the, the, this, 
you know, the, the one still is in a big youth, uh, juventud, so it's, it's young for being 20 years old. And, and I think that also it reflects a little bit the style that my, fa my family was doing the wine before, okay? So actually I, I saw one of the questions that, okay, what is your style, modern, uh, traditional? I think that modern, traditional, it changes depending on the year that you're talking about. And what we consider modern today, it was not, it was 20 years uh, before. So on that time, my family, they were using a little bit more, uh, mo uh, more new oak. So in this case, it was mainly new oak with some of second use uh, barrels. Uh, all the, the vineyards were coming Tempranillo and Graciano. So this is why we were not using the Crenas from the Salto Najrilla, from uh, where my family is coming from. And I think the wine reflects very well that. So it has a lot of structure. I think that, you know, it has a very powerful nose, uh, very aromatic. Still, there is a lot of fruit in there, but then you have a lot of complexity of, uh, you know, the tobacco, a little bit the vanilla, this, um, this uh, toastiness, this um, a little bit uh, manzanilla, this oxidation, little touch, okay? Because I think it still is very, very, very bright. And, um, and then, you know, last, like Etienne was saying before, I think that, uh, well, this, this wine was uh, about, I mean, I know what, for what my father tell me, but I think it was about... Uh, 30, 25% Graciano, so it was a big percentage. Wow. Uh, yeah, no, nowadays we don't use that much Graciano than, than before. And this character, this, uh, this, uh, this big structure, uh, you know, the acidity that it has, and this is why it's, uh, it's uh, uh, you know, today is still so bright. I think that reflects also this blend on, on that time. It is, it's, it's, it's smoky and what I would call savory from this, long aging, you know, 19, nearly 20 years, mm -hmm. wine is still alive and fresh mm -hmm. and quite refined and mellow. Um, it's, it's a wine that reminds me, makes me think of warm, warm, cozy winter evenings in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, in my mind, this shows as a wine that we would explain or, or, or convey to our membership as being now in the traditional mold because really I think the traditional style even if it was made in a modern way with this 19 years of age it has slowly carefully aged with you know the oxygen has helped mellow it add mm. complexity of flavor and I mean, it's a wine that you should be drinking, you know, over the next few years. It feels like it's, you know, drinking at its very, very, very best. It's um, quite impressive how well it's aged. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that, Pierre, I mean, I, you know, probably to 19 years ago, my family was doing more modern wines, as we consider modern wines, before as we make today. Exactly. So, but this is why it's uh, that much color, probably had a, a little bit more maceration that we have today, but you define it perfectly. I think this is a wine that the years have became, has made uh, the wine to be more mellow and to get, to get this balance that probably didn't have uh, in, uh, so this is a wine but that, by the way, we, we released uh, very recently, okay? So it's, uh, it's been waiting in the winery for, for a long time, but this wine to be drink probably, let's say 10 years ago, it was too modern and will not have the personality that it has right now. Thank you, Ricardo. Well, that was fascinating. So um, my summary of the wines, just before we go to the questions, um, three really different styles, three wines from very different vintages, 2014, so still quite a young, youthful, exuberant, generous wine, the El Sacramento. 2010 Vigneriel Grand Reserva, which is quite refined and, and gentle, uh, starting to drink well now, but knowing Vigneriel's pedigree, it's a wine that will last for for many, many, many more years. And um, I guess, uh, I haven't checked actually, but I guess that our official drink date that we publish on, our, um, on the Wine Society's website will be quite a modest one because we always are more cautious in our drink dates. 
And then finally, uh, the very sort of traditionally framed um, Lopez de Haro um, as a really fully mature, gentle and mellow uh, Rioja. That was fascinating. Um, and you can tell that I'm pretty energized and very happy that you guys have given me the privilege and the opportunity to try these three wines together from the from the comfort of my own home. So thank you. <laughs> Anna. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And actually, you beat me to it because uh, I was also, I think, probably the only other person in the UK lucky enough to have the three wines. Um, and I have tasted all three. I was going to ask you to sum them all up in one single word, but you did even better than that. And you gave them a little few more words. <laughs> exactly. But <it's> wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Um, I completely agree. Tasting them side by side has been really eye opening. Uh, but they're three fantastic wines for lots of different reasons. Um, we have had plenty of questions, so I'm going to try and get through as many as we possibly can. Uh, the official end time for this evening was half past seven UK time, so let's see how we get on. Um, but the first question of the evening was from Alistair, um, and Alistair has asked me to ask on his behalf. Um, Pierre, I'll direct it to you and then perhaps you can send it out to whoever you think appropriate. But the question is, I noticed a general trend of increased alcohol in Rioja in recent years. Is this purely due to global warming or are there other factors involved? And do you, the panelists, see it as a good thing? That's a good question, Anna. Um, I think I'm going to direct that to Maria, given Maria, you have been making wine in Rioja, the Cune, you said, well, um... <laughs> years. Um, have you, uh, number one, have you noticed that alcohol levels are increasing? And number two, if you have, what do you think have been the factors that have um, impacted that or, or resulted in, in higher alcohol levels? Uh, well, uh, not a lot, but uh, maybe, yes, the alcoholic degree has increased a little bit. I said not a lot because I have the analyze uh, uh, for Imperial and Viña Real, uh, some bottles in the 40s, 50s, and we had uh, uh, 13 uh, degrees. But a little bit uh, is, uh, is sure that, uh, and I think uh, there are uh, more than one reason. One reason it could be the warm, the warm change that uh, the the warm climate. Uh, that's sure. That's sure. But also is I think because. Uh, we, we are waiting now more time to, to do the harvest in, in order to, to look for the polyphenolic uh, uh, ripeness also. And uh, maybe before it was not so important, the color in the wines. And, and, and now we look for the tannins, for the polyphenols, for the color. And then we have to, to wait a little bit because sometimes the maturity of the sugar is not in the same, at the same time that the polyphenols ripeness. And then I think it's in all things, it's a little bit is increasing, that's true. It's, uh, and um, in, in one hand is uh, because uh, we wait and in the other hand too is for the climatic uh, change. Sure, I think uh, the other element is irrespective of of how alcohol levels may have increased um, even marginally, actually the most important thing is balance in a wine. So yes. uh, there are Riocas that are being made at 12 and a half, 13% that are in fantastic balance. There are also Riocas at 14, 14 and a half percent that are in balance um, and a fantastic quality, but there are also examples um, at those alcohol levels that are not so in balance and actually balance between alcohol, fruit concentration, body and tannin is really what. Yes, but what it's true that we have to keep the acidity also and the balance. And the acidity. Acidity. Yes. Mm. Certainly. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, the next question we have, again, um, I should say these members have asked me to ask on their behalf. However, if you do submit a question, let us know if you want to ask yourselves. We are able to unmute you and you can ask these lovely people uh, directly. So let us know. 
But this is a question from Philip Tuck. And Philip says, uh, are the aging regulations relating to Reserva and Gran Reserva in Rioja outdated? <laughs> <laughs> the million dollar question, Pierre. <laughs> uh, that is a, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I have a view, um, but I, I, I think I'm going to hold my, my view back. Uh, Etienne, what's your view as a newer, um, a newer producer in, 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 um, in Rioja? Are the terms Reserva, Grand Reserva outdated as the question that Philip Tuck has just asked? No, I, I don't think it's outdated uh, at all. <clears throat> but in my case, I, uh, I'm uh, in a chateau's time and I intend to express a terroir. And I think the terroir is uh, above this classification. It's more important the quality of the grapes, where do they come from, than the aging. And so in my case, I didn't choose to enter in this cla classical qualification. But that doesn't mean that this classification is uh, old fashioned. I think it's a tradition in Rioja and Spanish market. And uh, uh, the wineries uh, select grapes to age to the Grand Reserva is very respectful. They, they are doing a great job in this way. And so, uh, you, don't have, uh, you don't have to, no, it's like the politician today, they, they want to, to preserve something and to eject everything. No, it's not like that. I think uh, we have to respect this history and uh, it's a good thing. And this tradition is a very good thing. And we have wines in the Rioja able to age a lot. So Grand Reserva, if you have a good product in the beginning, it has all its sense. Bueno, in the case of El Sacramento, as I focus on terroir, but it's not relevant for me. And in the exportation market, there is a lot of consumer who doesn't care so much uh, because they, they are consumers of Bordeaux, of Burgundy, of Tuscany, where this classification doesn't exist. So you can sell your wine without going on this traditional classification. But, but I'm not at all, again, uh, in contrast of this kind of uh, classification. I think it's a good, it's a good uh, uh, ADN of Rioja yeah. and in general. Yeah, thanks, Etienne. I, 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 I agree. I think it's not at all outdated. It's, a, it's an indication exactly of how the wine was made because it indicates how the wine was aged. Um, the, the, the disadvantage or the challenge around the aging requirements is that it doesn't necessarily indicate quality even though within the wine drinker's mind, it might mean quality. So generally, Grand Reserva should be higher quality than Reserva and, and, and Criantha and so on. My tip to members of the Wine Society is that you should follow a producer. So the best producers will put their best grapes into the Grand Reserva. Um, in fact, the best producers use the aging requirements as a really good strategy to deal with mother nature. So when the vintage isn't particularly good, they'll put their best grapes into Reserva or into Criantha and not make any Grand Reserva. So um, yeah, my tip is follow the name, follow a producer, um, because you have to trust that the producer is putting their finest grapes into Grand Reserva. Um, so that, that's my little tip. Anna, what's the next question? Absolutely. I'm going to combine a couple of questions, if that's all right, um, because we've had somebody ask about the sort of category. 
sector. I think Maria in particular, you spoke a bit about the subregions, but also um, we've had somebody ask as well about the difference between the soil types. So it kind of goes back to what we've just been talking about, that perhaps the terroir is the difference. Um, so I wondered if uh, perhaps we could have a bit of an explanation about the different terroir of the regions within Rioja. The different terroir. So who, Ricardo, would you like to? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, well, <laughs> well, so the question is uh, what, how to explain the different terroirs in, in Rioja, right? So that's a little bit the, yeah, well, I mean, Rioja is so diverse. I, I mean, I think this is the great, uh, the amazing thing of, of Rioja because, you know, in uh, Rioja is 65,000 hectares. We have very different climates from one region to the other and different type of soils. But um, I mean, Rioja, if, uh, you know, the three main type of uh, soils that we have is the, this uh, calcareous clay that I was mentioning before, this uh, more uh, uh, cal chalk, no, right? <laughs> Then it, the ferrous clay is the second one, which is the, the more that is more dominant in Rioja Alta. And finally, we have this more um, rocky soil, okay, which is a little bit more typical in the riverside uh, along the, the Ebro. So this is the three main typical soils. Then we have a uh, two main different, let's say, a climate, which is the more uh, one of Rioja Alta and Rioja La Vesa, which is a bit colder. And then in Rioja Alta, which is a bit more Mediterranean and dry. And this would be the general explanation of the different types. But what then the key and what is, makes this question so complicated is that terroir is not about a particular area itself. It's, it's a particular spot, okay? And, uh, and, you know, in the same village. And, and that's something, you know, this is how, why the wine, the world of wine is so marvelous and so complicated. Even in San Vicente de la Sonsierra, which is a fantastic village, you have some soil, some terroir, which are not interested which are ones, for example, ones of the river, which the, um, the soils are more rich in, in uh, uh, more rich in general, more water. And then they don't have anything to do with the ones who are in the hills. Okay, so actually in the, in, only in San Vicente de la Sonsierra, you have three different main type of soils. And then in this, in one particular area of the, of the mountains, you have even in that area, different type of soil. So, it's uh, so, so, so complex. And related to the question before, uh, I think that the terroir and, uh, and the farming, uh, the, the care of the farming are what, are what are much more important than Reserva, Gran Reserva or anything like that. But I think that right now, when we start to talk, that we, in this conversation, we'll be talking about soup zones, okay? I think that Rio Heights in a moment of change, okay? So before, uh, wineries didn't talk that much about a particular area and terroir. And I think that we remain still using this uh, classical uh, classical Gran Reserva, Rio uh, Reserva, Crianza. But little by little, we are more and more uh, communicating about the terroir of our vineyards and, uh, and the importance of, of the place of uh, where the vineyards are and how we trade them. I don't, I don't know if I answered. It's kind of complicated yeah. question. Eh? <laughs> really, really difficult question. Um, a, a, a big question and, and very, very well articulated. Thank you, Ricardo. I wonder whether briefly, just to get everyone's thoughts, Pierre, it might be nice if um, people might be able to just give a short flavour of what defines their terroir. You know, what Good makes, idea, yes. What makes everybody different. So perhaps, Ricardo, since you since you started, maybe we could start with you, if that's all right. What is the terroir of Lopez de Aro? Well, it's, a, it's a, a lot to say because, of course, <laughs> I mean, there is not always the same. But if I have to, actually, I tried to explain in, in, the, in the presentation. So the two terroirs that we, I think, you know, as a company, we, we in Lopez de Aro, we try to keep the style that uh, you know has been doing wine for for thousands or hundreds of years okay and is the the blending i mean we are not uh, afraid of talking about that we blend from different areas i think you know there is this chateau model which is wonderful and it's it's growing and growing and it's making rioja more interesting okay and uh, like uh, you know in the case of maria it's continuo and uh, etienne and but then for example wine is like lope de Aro, we try to blend from, from different terroirs. In our case, the two more dominant would be uh, this more ferrous clay in the hills of, uh, of the high altitude uh, Alto Najerilla, which is where my family is coming from. Uh, this is a region that, uh, you know, when my father was young, 
you know, the maturation was very difficult to arrive because, uh, you know, it was uh, higher in altitude, uh, there was uh, colder years, and also these more ferrous clay are a little bit more uh, higher in acidity, so they were more focused for whites and roses, but today uh, are being actually some of the best of, of our vineyards, and mixed with the more some Sierra type of soils, which are uh, these calcareous clay, and then we, what we are looking is for the poorer soils, for the ones who are in the hills with more wind. Actually, in San Vicente, it's very, very different the ones who are not uh, influenced by the, by the north wind than the others that are, that are. And actually, we are looking for the more of freshness, uh, a little bit more in the hills, higher in altitude, and with uh, poorer soils and a fresher weather. So that's uh, the two main, our main, our, our favorites, let's say. And Maria, what about for you? What's the, how would you define the terroir of Vigna Real? Well, Vigna Real has uh, also is a Rioja la Besa, then we have uh, limestone and clay. Um, we have the different plots, very small plots to do the, to produce the, the, the Vigna Real Reserva and Gran Reserva. And uh, then uh, each plot is, is different. No? But uh, all the clay soils are, are um, cool, cool uh, soils. And then uh, I, I like because uh, it keeps the, 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 the acidity and it keeps the, the water and the, the nutrients also. And then uh, wines are very elegant and very rich. And uh, the ripeness in, in these uh, soils are quite uh, slowly and, and I like it. And uh, then um, we are clay um, and limestone too, that uh, limestone gives uh, wines that are very, very uh, elegant. And uh, usually we have uh, these, two, these two soils, yes. Um, but it's important also that uh, we have uh, some uh, vineyards that uh, with the presence of the pebbles. The, and uh, that's very nice also because uh, uh, this soils uh, keep the, 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 the heat uh, from, the, from the day during the, the night. And uh, I think uh, different soils give more complexity to the, to the wines. And that's what uh, I, I like a lot, no? different plots and small plots. And it's important also the, the, we have the, the, the soils that are uh, quite poor. And, um, and then the, the production is, uh, is also uh, smaller. And then uh, there are more richness in the, in the grapes and they are more savory. And uh, well, I think uh, that's uh, more or less. And thank you. Uh, Etienne, for you, the terroir. Uh, <clears throat> well, no, uh, we are in one place. Uh, we have 20 hectares around the, the winery. And uh, the terroir, uh, <coughs> as Ricardo said, we are in a place and we have very different plots. And uh, that's the, the, the quality of this area, is the diversity. In a place to have so, diff so much differences and each plot has its quality, its advantages, and so uh, the terroir in the diversity uh, is a, a quality of this area. The complexity of the wines we produce come from, from that. And, and the terroir is, is, is the place, the soil where the vine is nutrition, is the climate complex also, and then the, the way you are working to, to manage all this, and it, it's, a, uh, it's a quality of this, of this place, a special quality. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the comments of uh, members of the wine society, and uh, Rioja can compete with greatest wine in the world because of this complexity we have here locally. And even in, in a small place like we are in Sacramento, we have this diversity, and uh, that's a, a big advantage to, to elaborate uh, complex wine, uh, balanced. Uh, it's a, it's an, a, great, a great advantage. Absolutely. Anna, any more questions? 
Yes, we do. We have plenty. <laughs> I do apologise. I don't think we will get through all of them, but we'll try our best. Um, we have another question, um, or uh, perhaps a slightly more controversial question, I should say, uh, from Alistair saying, do you feel that Syrah, Cabernet, Merlot, etc., will play a bigger part in the future of Rioja? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I want to meet one. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd like to answer that one, not least because um, I, I hope to influence the fellow panelists. Um, my aunt, simple answer is I hope not. Um, and I, the analogy that I use, you know, that the, the Spain, not just Rioja, but Spain has some of the most wonderful local indigenous native grapes. Um, it also does grow international grapes too, and it does it quite successfully. The analogy I use is when you go on holiday to Spain, you want to eat Spanish food. It always surprises me when you go to the coastal resorts of which the British are quite strong visitors of. Um, it fascinates me that it's almost easier to get to find, you know, your English fried breakfast um, than it is to find local Spanish food. And I think that's a great shame. And for that reason, um, I think it would be a great shame if Rioja was to start to grow international black or red grape varieties um, like Syrah, Merlot or Cabernet. Uh, there are, I'm, I'm not even sure if they're permitted. I know some international white varieties are permitted. I think Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay and the, the Deco are permitted. Um, and, um, you know, that's, a, that's a probably a political decision. And the wines I've tried that have been made from those grapes taste, taste good. Um, they don't taste bad at all. Um, but my policy for the Wine Society's range of Rioja wines is to stick to wines that are made by indigenous grapes, or even some of the, un, the newly rediscovered grapes like um, Maturana, uh, Maturana uh, uh, Blanca, Maturana Tinta, Garnacha Blanca, Torontes, um, uh, Tempranillo Blanco. There's some fantastic uh, grapes varieties. Would, would any of the panelists like to add uh, that? I think that's a, it's a good question because it's uh, it creates some um, it creates some good debate. Ricardo. Well, I actually I don't I not only think that they will never success. I also think that I will fight against it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and and actually you know I'm gonna tell something. I think that Spain has been a country that for the during the 20th century we had a, a lot of complex. Inferiority complex on some, some things, but since we won one World Cup and two Euro Cups, okay, <laughs> I think that finally we are trusting <laughs> of uh, in our roots, okay. Yes, and in the wine industry, it's happening 100%. So I think that now it, we are in a very exciting time of the history that every region, even small or big, are looking back to the roots. They are rediscovering grapes, like you were mentioning, Pierre. And I think this is a way, this is a path that I think that we will, at least for the next generation, we will never go backwards. I think that the that we are looking is for uh, working the Mencia, Invierzo, Godello in Valdeorras, uh, talking about these local grapes everywhere. And I think that the international grapes are for uh, the new world, which they make a fantastic job, and for France and for the regions where it's a native grape for them. Absolutely, thank you. I don't know whether anybody else wanted to mention anything as well, Etienne or Maria, if you had any extra thoughts to add to Ricardo's point. Well, I, I agree absolutely with uh, Ricardo and uh, with, with, with uh, Pierre, and uh, they have explained uh, very, very well. Then uh, I, I, I am the same opinion. I think uh, now we are in a very good moment and uh, we have uh, varieties, uh, not only Tempranillo, but uh, the other grapes that uh, performs very, very well in our soils. And I think uh, that's the, the way um, we, can, we can do the very, very uh, good ones with uh, these grapes, yes. 
And I saw you nodding, Etienne, so I think you're in agreement also. <laughs> no, I, I, I do agree with Ricardo and Maria. It's, it's a nonsense to... But I, I understand the question. Uh, when you are a wine lover or wine tester, you you interested in the, the, the grapes and the flavor of each grapes. Uh, but we are in a more complex uh, area and with this history, with complexity, and Tempranillo uh, is a success here, and we don't have to, to fight with uh, Cabernet from Chile. It would be a mistake. And also, you know, uh, Cabernet, Sierra, Tempranillo, uh, it's a thing, but then the clone you use, if it's Bassa selection, if it's cloning, uh, it's much more complex. And you have to, to play with the terroir you have. You have uh, hundreds of Cabernet difference. It depends on the clone of the, and then uh, the Cabernet you planted in the Poyac is different the, the way they, they choose to the plant than the, the Cabernet they plant, they, they are planted in, the, in Montpellier. So it, it, it's, it's much more complex that uh, a consumer can, uh, the point of view of a consumer when he buys a bottle of Merlot, a bottle of Cabernet. And uh, it's difficult to explain because, uh, well, no, but it's our work. And uh, the, the sensitive way or the, the, uh, the most sensible way to work is, is to adapt with the, uh, the condition, local condition. And it doesn't make sense to, to plant those kind of international grapes where we are. Thank you so much. Um, so I am going to sneak in one more question because I think it's probably a question that all of the UK have on their lips, especially as we're about to get locked down again. However, um, before that, I would just like to mention, we have posted in the chat, all of the wines that we tasted this evening. Tomorrow I will be sending a follow-up email. I'll include the wines. I've also got some more videos to share with you from the wineries. Um, and if anybody wants any of the maps or images that we showed today as well, please do let us know. I'm sure that everyone would be very happy, especially to share maps, which I know lots of you are very fond of. Um, but the final question, I believe we have unmuted Peter Cousins. So Peter, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello, Peter. Good evening. Good evening. And thank you very much for those presentations. It certainly encouraged me to spend some money on wine while we've been listening. <laughs> um, uh, it's a non-technical question. I've been asked by some friends to, uh, to organise a wine trip to Rioja next year, if we're allowed to. Travel. Um, I wondered if, uh, if visits to your wineries are something you encourage. If you do, what do you think is the best time of year to come? Ricardo, why don't you start? I yeah. think we can go around the panel. It's a great question, Peter. It's an amazing question, and thanks for the question, Peter. I think that there is no other way better to discover our wines and our culture and our wineries than come to visit us. So you are 100% invited. Uh, and I talk about Rioja in general, because I think that Rioja is... Rioja is day by every day uh, opening more and more uh, wineries to visit. In our case, Lope de Aro, we are open for visits and uh, we have, you know, uh, since there's something quite simple and quick, if you don't have enough time just to taste a few wines and show you a little bit our philosophy, uh, till visiting the area, the historic places and talking a little bit more, much more about the depth of the Son Sierra and our roots. So, uh, I mean, super welcome to that. And I think that the best time of the year 100% will be right now. So I think that, uh, you know, the end of the harvest is the time when you see this wonderful, beautiful color that are not always easy to see during, uh, around Spain because other areas, they lose the, the leaves uh, earlier or they, they have it more drier. So they have a wonderful autumn. And I think autumn is definitely the best time to come over. Thanks, Ricardo. Etienne. Yeah, you, you're invited. And I, I said to you, Pierre, every wine society 
uh, members you send to us, we are more than happy to receive them. We, we don't do, we, we, as we focus on production, we are not organized to, to the, tu the, the tourists. But uh, people recommend it, we, we, we received with a lot of pleasure. And, uh, and we made a tour of the vineyard here around, the winery, we made a tasting, and I do that, I receive. So I will be very happy to, to have some visit. And uh, good moment, but no, it's true, like Ricardo uh, said, that the, the landscape with those, uh, the leaves changing of color now, it's, it's, it's amazing. Now it's amazing. But the Rioja, all the, lay, the year long, is, is fantastic. It's, yeah, uh, it's, absolutely. Uh, we have a beautiful landscape. And, uh, well, no, I, I would be very happy to receive. <laughs> Maria. Yes, of course. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to take a visit. And you all are uh, invited. And uh, we are open from uh, Monday to Sunday. And we offer different uh, types of visit. We can, uh, you can visit the, the wineries, the three wineries in Rioja. Eh, Cunearo is the tradition. Eh, Viña Real is the technology. Continuo is the vineyard. And uh, well, we, you can visit the vineyards and tasting or visit the, the wineries, of course, eh, when you want. Eh, it's true that uh, harvest is very, very nice. The landscape uh, now in autumn is uh, beautiful, but uh, all time, Rioja is a very nice place uh, to visit, I think. And it, uh, it's very easy to get to as well, which is great. It's so easy to, to fly from London to, to Bilbao. Um, I, I'm fortunate to, to, to be able to travel to Rioja a lot and I think if I was going uh, as a as a as a tourist, I would definitely go in the autumn. The autumn is beautiful in Rioja, and I would visit these guys. And I would also make sure you spend an evening in Lagrano because the tapas in Lagrano are legendary. Um, there's a, a street there called Calle Laurel, which is just um, got the most incredible tapas. A fantastic. Uh, fantastic time. Um, so fingers crossed that um, we'll, we'll be out of this uh, situation that 2020 has brought us um, in time for you to be able to make that trip later, um, next year. Thank you all so much. Apologies for the sound issues there, but Pierre couldn't agree with the sentiments more. I'm now desperate to visit Rioja. Um, even more so than I was an hour and a half ago. So um, you'll have to hold me back, I think. A flight will certainly be booked next year if I can, and I will hopefully come and see the beautiful vineyards um, and taste some glorious wines. So from the tastings team, I'd like to say a huge, huge thank you to Pierre, to Etienne, Ricardo, and to Maria. Um, I think Hopefully members would agree this has been a really enlightening evening, but it's also been lovely to see so many different opinions, different styles of wine um, and different wineries. So I'll hand over to Pierre for a final, uh, final sign off, but thank you to everyone who joined this evening, to our dear members. Again, I hope you can all visit Rioja as well uh, next year if you can. And uh, yes, cheers, thank you. Cheers, thanks Anna. Um, Maria, Etienne, Ricardo, thank you so much for giving up your evening to, well, just to give us an insight into the world of, of Rioja, because it's, it's a world that is just so multi-layered and there is so much going on in terms of the wines. And, um, you know, thankfully, uh, Mother Nature in the vineyards doesn't stop because of COVID. I know it's bringing um, all of you uh, challenges as it's bringing everyone challenges in, in daily life and in running businesses. Um, but uh, um, I understand that the vintage 2020, that, that's um, coming, coming, well, it would have finished now, I understand, and Etienne was telling me it's uh, uh, been a, a successful vintage. But thank you so much. Thank you on behalf of members of the Wine Society and um, 
I hope to see you in person soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Anne. And thank you, Catherine and Pierre. Thank you. Thank you.